Hey, I'm Matt Caruso. In today's video, we're kicking off a new series called Timeless Investing Wisdom, where I'm going to be picking apart interviews, books, articles, video snippets of legendary investors to find timeless wisdom that kind of transcends strategy, transcends era. That's a truism of investing that really applies to all traders, anyone active in the market, regardless of how they're trading. If you enjoy this video, please subscribe. It does help grow the channel. You can also visit me at CarusoInsights.com where I have my Active Growth Investor course and the AGI Pro membership. So we're gonna kick off this series by studying Bruce Kovner. So Bruce is one of the original market wizards in Jack Schweiger's phenomenal Market Wizards series. I think he's particularly interesting to study for a number of reasons. One, he didn't come from wealth. His grandparents were Eastern European immigrants. He went to public school. Uh, as well, he kind of started at later age, he started only at 31 years old that he get really interested and active in the markets. He was actually studying public policy and then after he got into the markets at 31. So I think sometimes people kind of feel like, oh, I didn't study that, it wasn't my major and I missed my shot. And that's definitely not the case with Bruce because despite starting at 31 years old with $3,000, he's currently worth over $6 billion, ranking him as the 133rd richest American and 383rd richest person in the world according to Forbes. So let's take a look at this amazing career that he had, some key lessons. We're gonna be particularly studying the interview that we that Jack Schweiger had in the book Market Wizards. And this is a first snippet. There's just too much to go over. So we're, we'll do even different videos on Bruce himself. But let's get started with the very beginning of that interview where Bruce discusses his first trade where he really kind of begins to understand and accept risk. So this is a quote from Market Wizards. I went into emotional shock. I could not believe how stupid I had been, how badly I had failed to understand the market in spite of having studied the market for years. I was sick to my stomach and I didn't eat for days. I thought that I had blown my career as a trader. When Jack Schweiger asked him, was it the stupidity of the mistake or was it the money that you had given back that caused such emotional pain? Bruce replied, no, it wasn't the money at all. I think it was the realization that there really was fire there. Until then, I had ridden $3,000 to $45,000 without a moment of pain, I think what bothered me so much was the realization that I had lost a process of rationality that I thought I had. And that moment, I realized that the markets were truly capable of taking money away every bit as fast as they gave it to you. That made a very strong impression on me. Actually, I was very lucky to get out with $22,000. For me, that was my going bust trade. It was the closest I ever came to going bust and psychologically it felt as if I had. And I didn't understand how risky my position was. When something happens to disturb my emotional equilibrium and my sense of what the world is like, I close out all my positions related to that event. For example, on October 19th, 1987, the week of the stock market crash, I, clo I close out all my positions on October 19th and 20th because I felt there was something happening in the world that I didn't understand. The first rule of trading, there are probably many first rules, is don't get caught in a situation in which you can lose a great deal of money for reasons you don't understand. So this is a great example of how a successful trader has to learn that the hard way that the market can hurt them. I, I think everyone goes through this experience. I know I did as well. And you have these this first taste of a lot of money. I mean, 3,000 to 45, I know 45,000 doesn't sound like a, a monumental amount of money, but that's one heck of a return. And of course, back in the 80s, uh, before all these years of inflation, uh, $45,000 was quite a bit more. So, you know, I think the psychological process as well as him kind of saying it felt like he had gone bust. It felt like he had failed. We put so much emotional strain on ourselves when things don't go well because we have these expectations of what we can make, what we can do, uh, that it's really a difficult journey. So I, I think number one, really understanding that the markets can be risky. And he adapted as a result. He learned his lesson. You know, he made a rule. If ever there's something that I, I don't understand and it upsets my emotional equilibrium, I get out of the market. He used that in 1987, years later, and that helped him to kind of, you know, walk through that incredibly diff difficult and, and volatile time. As well, he learned to adapt to have rules that help him to understand how risky his positions are. So oftentimes we'll put in different positions. You know, you could be in technology stocks and put on five technology stocks. You don't realize really they're all correlated together. So you think you're in different positions, but you're not really diversified. I mean, to even go one step further, sometimes, you know, that, that maybe is fairly easy to see that, well, there's concentration in tech, but sometimes maybe you're just in multiple growth stocks that are from different groups, but because they have a similar profile in terms of growth, 
they're actually very much correlated to each other. So you could have a, a home furnishings company, you can have a technology, an internet-based company, you can have a, 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 a new car upstart company. And so you feel like, oh, I'm diversified across industries, but you're actually very concentrated within one key uh, kind of portion of the market, that high growth part of the market. So now it's, it's not that you can't be concentrated, but I think it's like he mentioned, he, understanding what risk you're taking on. I think it's not a, the problem of taking on risk is not an issue. All great investors live with the risk. Risk is part of our, their lives. It's being able to measure and understand the risk that you're taking on is absolutely critical. So let's shift to mindset. You know, he, he basically said that that kind of shocked him and he felt it was like his going broke moment. And so a lot of going through the markets, a lot of the main principles will come back down to mindset. So there's there's one lesson that he learned from Michael Marcus. Michael Marcus is another uh, kind of market wizard from market wizards we'll discuss in some other future videos. Um, and this is a lesson that he credits to Michael Marcus on optimism. Let's take a look at what Bruce said. Michael taught me one thing that was incredibly important. He taught me that you could make a million dollars. He showed me that if you applied yourself, great things could happen. It is very easy to miss the point that you really can do it. He showed me that if you take a position and use discipline, you can actually make it. So I, I know this sounds like maybe an unimportant lesson, just kind of being up the fact that you could make it. But you know, right now as I'm doing this recording, it's uh, you know April 2023. Markets have been difficult. Uh, last year was a bear market. Markets have been very choppy to start the year. And if you know a lot of professional investors over time, you'll notice many professional traders are very are very cynical. You know they've been through a lot, many stories, many promises of the next big incredible company turn out to just be a lot of hype and nothing is true. So it, it becomes it becomes very difficult to kind of believe what you read and you question everything. And, and I think that's a very good quality. It's a typical quality of uh, most successful investors that they, they do question. They, they look at things from different angles. Um, but I think it's important and it's interesting that he even took the time to say a very important lesson. Actually, in the actual blurb, uh, Jack Schweiger says, well, what is it? You know, he, he paused for how important it was and the importance to have that optimism. You know, another market wizard and someone who's had a massive impact on me is um, William O'Neill. You know, he's always said that I never met a successful pessimist and he was always an incredibly optimistic person. So I, I think being able to get up every morning and, and challenge that market, which is not always easy to do, trust me, forcing and building that process of optimism and persistence in yourself is absolutely critical. Well, let's take a look at another lesson that he attributes that he learned from Michael Marcus uh, discussed here in Market Wizards. He also taught me one other thing that is absolutely critical. You have to be willing to make your mistakes regularly. There's nothing wrong with it. Michael taught me about making your best judgment, being wrong, making your next best judgment, being wrong again, making your third best judgment, and then doubling your money. So this is a great example that Bruce brings up here where it's not about being right all the time that makes you money in the markets. I mean, some people run a high win percentage strategy. There's, there's few who, are, you know, typically it's related with more high frequency type trading, but it's okay to be wrong most of the time and make money. Think of this really simple example that he breaks down. You're wrong once, you're wrong t twice, then the third time you double your money. Well, that's a system with a win rate of only 33%. So you're wrong two thirds of the time. Ultimately, you end up a winner, but can you live with that kind of system? Can you live with also being able to be wrong all the time? Again, society kind of trains us to, to want to be right. You, you know, you write your exams and it's about how many questions you get right, is, you know, whether you pass or not. If you're working in an office, you know, it's, it's, are you doing your job properly? Are you executing properly, getting everything right? You, you can't kind of say to your boss, well, I got 70% of the stuff wrong today, but I did 30% really well. That's not really going to fly. <laughs> but in the markets, it's a very different type of world. And you're thinking completely differently. So most people kind of come to the markets thinking that they need to know something, thinking that very successful investors do know something. Well, the real secret is that legendary investors don't know anything, and they respect that. They know that they're always dealing with probability and outcomes uh, and unknowable outcomes. And, and they have to kind of always protect their risk in order to be able to survive so that they can, when they're right, they can make enough money and, and really uh, advance anyways. So it comes down to probability, risk versus reward, and that's just the key equation, again, that kind of transcends what type of strategy you're working. 
It doesn't matter if you're wrong more often, but you better be making more when you're right than when you're wrong. I think it's absolutely critical. So one last point that I want to discuss here uh, for today's video is, you know, Jack Schweiger takes a moment and asks, well, you're incredibly successful. What differentiates you from the average trader and what makes a regular, what makes a, a trader great? And I think Bruce's answer is phenomenal. It kind of goes back to the point we just discussed, you know, it regards that markets are all about a game of probability, unknowable outcomes and pivoting and adjusting and controlling your risk. Let's see what he says. First, I have the ability to imagine configurations of the world different from today and really believe it can happen. I can imagine that soybean prices can double or that the dollar can fall to 100 yen. Second, I stay rational and disciplined under pressure. I'll give you an example. During the past six months, I had good arguments for the Canadian dollar going down and good arguments for the Canadian dollar going up. It was unclear to me which interpretation was correct. If you had to put a gun to my head and force me to choose a market direction, I probably would have said down. Then the U.S.-Canadian trade pact was announced, which changed the entire picture. In fact, the market had broken out on the upside a few days earlier as negotiations were finishing up. At an instant, I felt completely comfortable saying that one of the major pieces in the valuation of the Canadian dollar had just changed and the market had already voted. Prior to the, the agreement, I had felt that the Canadian dollar was at the top of a hill and I wasn't sure whether it was going to roll backwards or forwards. When the market moved, I was prepared to go with the movement because we had a conjunction of two important elements, a major change in fundamentals, although I wasn't smart enough to know in which direction it would impact the market, and a technical price breakout to the upside. So this is a great example of dealing with very uncertain situations. I mean, here you can even throw into this evaluation of the U.S.-Canadian dollar uh, FX pair a, a possible new trade pact between these two countries. So many unknowable things that we're dealing with, and, but you have to analyze these markets in real time. So I think that one of the important elements is, one, you can't know always what's going to happen next, so you're dealing with these probabilities. Two, remaining rational under pressure. So he went out of his way to point that out in that it's so easy to kind of get wrapped up in the markets and get kind of um, dragged into this is what it's going to be and, and I'm going to be right. And if you're wrong, taking a, a kind of an emotional impact by that, that you, you believe that you're wrong, that you failed. He stays very rational, emotionally neutral, and he takes incoming data and he adjusts to it. He adapts to it. And he can envision different alternate scenarios. Here's a legend saying, I'm looking at this U.S. Canadian dollar pair I don't know if it's going to go up or down. I can make a great argument for it to go up. I can make a great argument for it to go down. If this would just be anybody on the street that you're listening to, you say, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. In reality, you're talking to a legendary multi-billion dollar successful investor, but that's the reality of the market. And respecting that you can't possibly know all the outcomes, knowing what are the key pieces at any point in time in the market, and then adjusting to new information is absolutely critical while staying rational, under pressure, staying disciplined under pressure. So again, bringing in the unknowable, bringing in the risk reward, bringing in, um, you know, not having to be right all the time and executing with a clear mind with discipline is absolutely critical. So you can see, even as a global macro, macro investor, the key tools, the way he analyzes the market, the mindset is uh, very similar to what you've heard, I'm sure other investors say. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. This is just to start a small snippet. We're going to get into more Bruce Kovner in a future uh, video. Again, I, I think he's a great guy to study because he has just so much knowledge and the way he kind of breaks down his process is great. Um, thinking through your investing process, how does what Bruce said, you know, impact you? Do you have that kind of emotional discipline that that rationality under pressure? Are you able to envision different scenarios? That's something I've always challenged myself to do all the time is I have this position on. Whenever I'm buying a stock, someone's selling it to me. And you know, if you're trading actively and you're trading in size, this other person on the other side is probably a very intelligent person with you know, well-built models or you know, rational you know, uh, decision-making. So if they have the exact opposite view of you, one of you is gonna be wrong. So I think it's important to challenge yourself to come with these different viewpoints. And that may sound simple on the surface, but if you kind of challenge yourself, it's also the kind of, it's easy to get lost in the weeds. Then after you don't know what to believe anymore. So you want to have your process. You want to be disciplined with your process, but know that you may have to adapt if certain key variables change along the way. 
So how, how have you done that in your trading? Do you challenge yourself with viewpoints? Are you able to stay kind of disciplined and, and you know, rational? What, you know, have, have you been able to execute to do, do you see all of these key principles affect your trading? Let me know in the comments below. I've definitely seen everything that Bruce says impact me. So I, I really can see this as timeless, you know, wisdom that affects my strategies, even though I trade very differently than Bruce Kovner does. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe. It does help the channel. I appreciate that. Uh, you can follow me at CarusoInsights.com. We're going to have the Active Growth, Growth Investor course where I cover all of my methodology of how I approach the markets. There's also the AGI Pro membership where I discuss markets in real time. As well, I tweet very often on Twitter at Trader underscore M Caruso. We'll be back with more Bruce Kovner. We'll be back more with this Timeless Investing Wisdom series. Until then, good luck trading.